Azure Security Locks in a nutshell. What is an Azure Locks or what are Azure Locks? As an administrator, you can lock a subscription, a resource group, a resource to prevent users in your organization from accidentally deleting or modifying those critical resources. The lock overrides any permissions that the user may have, and you can set the lock level to cannot delete or read only. What are the types of locks? Well, Azure basically has two types of locks, and they are known as read only and delete lock. The read only lock is something similar to assigning a reader permission or reader role for your user. No changes can be made and it cannot be deleted. A delete lock with a delete lock authorized users will be able to read and modify the resources, but they will not be allowed to delete the resource. Where can you use Azure Locks? Azure Locks can again be applied to subscriptions, resource groups, or individual resources. When you lock a subscription, all resources in that subscription, including the ones added later, will inherit the same lock. Once applied, these locks have an impact on all users, regardless of their roles. If it becomes necessary to delete or change a resource with a lock in place, then the lock will need to be removed before this change can happen or occur. Who can deploy or delete or remove locks? Well, only the owner and the user access administrator are granted these permissions. Azure locks can be deployed and deleted using both the portal, bash, and PowerShell. To learn more about Azure locks, I encourage you to go to the link below, and this will give you more in depth about what you can and cannot do with Azure locks. That being said, let's dive into the lab and let's go and explore Azure locks. Hi, as you can see, I've gone ahead and logged into the portal. So in order to work with Azure Locks, the first thing we need to do is we need to create a resource. We can apply Azure Locks at a resource group level or at a resource individual level, such as a virtual machine. So in this lab, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna create a virtual machine from the ground up, and we're gonna apply some Azure Locks to that. And then we're gonna test out our locks. So the first thing you need to do is log into your portal and navigate to resource groups. If you cannot see resource groups in the menu here, just go to the top in the search and type in RES and select resource groups. Once in the resource groups blade, click create. And let's go ahead and create a resource group. I'm gonna call my resource group uh, Azure Lock Lab. I'm gonna leave it in the East US location. Click review and create and click create. This will go ahead and create that uh, resource group for us. Once that resource group has been created, We'll then go and put a virtual machine in that. So navigate to the top, you'll see your notification icon. I'm gonna dismiss all of my notifications because that was created successfully. So again, navigate to virtual machines. You should see virtual machines in your menu here. If you don't see virtual machines in the menu here, scroll up to the top and type in VIR and select virtual machines. Click create. From the drop down. select virtual machine. Go ahead and put that virtual machine in that lock lab. I'm gonna call this uh, lock VM. I'm gonna uh, scroll down. I'm going to select uh, my virtual machine. I'll select a 2016 or a 22 data center. I'm gonna scroll down. I'm going to select a username. I'm gonna select that user uh, uh, password. I'm going to type that password in again. I'm going to leave the defaults. I'm going to go next on disks. From the drop down, I'm going to select standard because it's a lot cheaper. But not, not only that, this is just a lab. We just want to learn how to create our locks. Click next on networking. Again, I'm going to accept all the defaults. I'm going to go next on management. Disable boot diagnostics because we don't need that. I'm going to turn off um, auto shutdown as well. I'm gonna click uh, next on the advanced tab, click next on tagging, click next to review and create. This is gonna go away and do a validation process. Once the validation has passed, you'll see a nice green bar at the top here or a green check mark. Click the create button and this will now go ahead and create that virtual machine. So we'll just wait a minute or two for that VM to be created and then we'll carry on with the lab.
as you can see our VM was created let's go to resources now in our resources underneath settings we can scroll down and select locks so let's go ahead and select locks and let's go ahead and add a lock click add and the first lock that we are going to add is a read only lock so I'm gonna paste the name in here I'm gonna call it read only I'm gonna leave it at read only because it's not a delete lock and again I'm going to call this my read only lock so I'm gonna go ahead and paste it in there and once we've added our lock sorry and click OK so now we've added our read only lock to that virtual machine I'm going to go ahead and hit the refresh button to make sure that lock has applied and then I'm going to navigate back to that virtual machine so let's navigate back to your virtual machines by clicking the virtual machines in the menu click on your VM let's give us some more real estate so let's go ahead and see this lock in action so I'm going to go ahead and dismiss all this notifications over here so can we stop this virtual machine well the first thing we want to do is see if we can delete the virtual machine so again I'm gonna hit the refresh button just to make sure it's refreshed and I'm gonna go ahead and press delete and this is gonna ask me do we want to delete that VM I'm gonna select everything in that VM because I want to delete it all I say I've read and I understand that it's all going to be deleted click the delete button and let's wait and see what's going to happen let's navigate up to the top and as you can see in our notification areas it's telling us we can't delete the virtual machine because that virtual machine has been locked so the lock is doing its thing it's stopping us from doing any accidental deletions or removal of that resource or resources so can we stop that virtual machine let's go ahead and click the stop button say yes I want to stop that virtual machine and let's see what happens and as you can see we've got another error and this error or warning is telling us that virtual machine cannot be stopped because it's in a read-only mode we know that because we created the lock so it says if you wanted to make changes you need to remove the lock so you can see it's it failed to stop that virtual machine because there is a uh, it cannot perform that right operation that VM has been locked okay um, so we can't stop it hey maybe we can restart it let's see so let's click the restart button say yes I want to restart that virtual machine let's see if it will allow us to restart that VM again I'm going to scroll over to the notification area and as you can see here I've got an error or and a warning again saying you cannot restart that virtual machine so with an Azure read only lock we cannot start the virtual machine we cannot stop the virtual machine and we cannot delete the virtual machine so therefore we've protected our resources against that accidental deletion so I'm going to go ahead and dismiss all that and I'm going to navigate back obviously to your virtual machine come down to locks and in your lock if I click delete this will actually remove that lock completely so now that covers the read only lock part but what about the delete part so let's go and add a delete lock I'm going to paste the name in there I'm going to from the drop down I'm going to call this uh, select delete and I'm going to go ahead and paste that in and click OK so now we've got a delete lock I'm going to go ahead and hit refresh then I'm going to navigate back to my virtual machine I'm going to just close it to get more real estate and I'm going to hit refresh so I'm going to go now and see if I can actually uh, stop this virtual machine so let's go ahead and uh, click stop can we stop the virtual machine click OK and let's scroll up to our notification area and you can see here it says it's stopping the virtual machine and let's give it a few more seconds and we'll see what's happening so I'm going to close that down and I'm going to hit the refresh button here and we'll just uh, see what's what's going on and as you can see it's deallocating that virtual machine in other words it's stopping that virtual machine so we can stop the virtual machine if we can stop it we should theoretically be able to restart it so let's wait for the notification error uh, message to complete and then we'll go ahead and we'll start that virtual machine again hit the refresh button this will always tell you what's going on 
uh, in your environment. So we'll just give that uh, a few seconds to stop. And as you can see, that didn't take too long. The virtual machine is actually stopped. It's in a deallocated mode. If I hit refresh, this will confirm that as well. If I hit the bell notification icon at the top here, this will tell me that virtual machine has stopped. So can we start that virtual machine? Let's go ahead and click start. And let's go to the bell notification icon. And as you can see, we can start that virtual machine. That virtual machine will start up. So I'm going to go ahead and just close that down and hit refresh. And you can see here that the virtual machine is starting. So we'll just give that a second or two to start. And as you can see, it's now changed into a running state. Hit refresh. This will tell us that that virtual machine is running. Let's go back to the bell notification and you can see that virtual machine has started. Well, that's great. We know we can stop the virtual machine and we can start the virtual machine with the delete only lock. What about deleting the virtual machine? So let's click the delete button and let's apply a force delete. And let's say we wanna delete all these resources and click delete. And let's see if we can delete that virtual machine. And let's scroll back up to our bell notification icon here and let's just give it a second and we'll see a warning should pop up short and there you go there's the warning the warning has popped up we cannot delete that virtual machine so we can start it and stop it with a delete lock but we cannot delete it so again we've protected our virtual machine against accidental deletion as well so again to remove a lock we just scroll to your resource in our case it's lock vm come down to locks underneath settings then we go ahead and click the delete and you can delete the lock here we can also edit the lock again if we wanted to we could drop down and we could change it to a read only lock if we wanted to we could click OK that would apply that lock we could hit refresh however the name will still tell us that it's a delete only lock because that's the name we gave it so in order to delete that lock we can go ahead and delete the lock here. We can apply locks at a subscription level and locks at a resource group level. And applying your lock at a resource group level, again, is great because it'll protect all those resources in that resource group. So in order to delete the lock, you just click delete and hit refresh, and that will go ahead and delete that lock. And if we navigate back to our virtual machines and we select our virtual machines, we should be able to go in here and actually physically delete our virtual machines. And we should be able to do that quite easy or delete that resource group. So again, that gives us a basic overview of how to apply uh, the different types of locks and what they do within our Azure environment. I'd like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next lab. Welcome to Azure Security in a Nutshell. And we're talking about Azure Network Security Groups or MSGs. So what is an Azure MSG or Network Security Group? An Azure Network Security Group or MSG is a core component of the Azure security fabric. You can use Azure Network Security Groups to filter network traffic to and from Azure resources in the Azure Virtual Network. A Network Security Group contains rules that allow or deny inbound traffic or outbound network traffic from several types of Azure resources. So how does a NSG work? Well, the NSG does an evaluation of these rules and it's done through a 5 triple H. This 5 triple H hash takes the value from the source port number, IP address, destination IP address and port number. It then allows it to associate it with a network security group with a VNet or a VM network interface very easily. And it works with layers 3 and layers 4 of the OSI model. So what's the difference? Well, a network security group is a firewall, but a very, very basic one. It's a Microsoft provided solution to filter traffic to the network layer, where an Azure firewall is a fully managed firewall that can analyze and filter uh, uh, layer three and layer four, as well as layer seven uh, traffic as well. On the Azure firewall also offers the same capabilities as the NSG, but it has many, many more additions. It's a robust service with tons of features to ensure maximum protection. And the cool thing is when you build a virtual machine in Azure, by default, it will create a network security group for you to keep your stuff secure. Again, I encourage you to go out to the Microsoft link below 
and learn more about uh, network security groups. Again, this is just a nutshell, giving you a basic high level overview. And that being said, let's dive into the lab and let's go and deploy a network security group and see how this works. Hi, as you can see, I've gone ahead and logged into the portal. And in this training lab, we want to learn how to create a network security group from the ground up. So go ahead and log into your portal and then navigate to resource groups. When you're in the resource groups blade, click create. Give your resource group a name. In my case, I'm going to call it NSG Lab. I'm going to click review and create and click create. This is going to go away and create that resource group. We will then go and put a virtual network in there. And then also we will go and create our network security group. So once that's uh, created, navigate over and type in um, network security group or NSG. And you'll see now you have your network security group here. So click network security groups, click create security group, put that security group in that uh, NSG uh, resource group. Let's give it a name. I'm going to call um, my uh, network security group. I'll just call it um, NSG lab and I'll go ahead and click review and create. So now it's creating that security group called NSG lab. So the next thing we need to do is we need to go and click the create button. Once the validation has successfully passed and we've got no errors, we can click the create button and this will go ahead and deploy that security group for us. So we'll just give it a few seconds to deploy. It shouldn't take too long. And as you can see, our network security group um, has deployed successfully. But at the moment, we don't have anything in there. So we need to go and create a virtual network. So navigate over to virtual networks, click create. Let's put that virtual network in that NSG um, resource group. Let's go and give it a name. I'm just going to call my virtual network NSG VNet. You can call yours whatever you like. It's up to you. I'm just pasting this from Notepad. I'm going next on IP addresses. And I'm going to go ahead and click on the default subnet. I'm going to change this name because I want a name that makes sense to me. So click the hyperlink that says default. And I'm going to go ahead and change that default name to something that's a lot more easier for me to understand. I'm going to call mine NSG subnet uh, lab. I'm going to click save. Then I'm going to go into the security section. I'm going to accept the defaults. In the tagging, we're not going to worry about that. I'm going to click next to review and create. This is going to go away and it's going to do a validation process to make sure that everything's all in line. I'm going to go ahead and click create and this will now create that virtual network. So we'll just wait a few seconds for that to create. It should create it very, very quickly. And as you can see, it's gone ahead and it's created our virtual network for us. So the next thing we need to do is we need to create a virtual machine and put it in that network security group. So navigate over to virtual machines, click create from the drop down, select Azure virtual machine. Let's put that Azure virtual machine in that NSG resource group. I'm just going to call this NSG VM. You can call it whatever you like. I'm going to leave it in the East location, East US location. We're not going to worry about redundancy. I'm going to select my Windows 2016 data center. You could select whatever image you wanted to from here. So it's all up to you. So I'm going to go ahead and type in a username. And then I'm going to go ahead and put in my password. I'm going to put the password in again. And I'm going to scroll down. I'm going to go next on disks. I'm going to select standard because it's a lot cheaper, but not only that, it's because this is a lab. Now this is where the magic happens. Click next on network. And now we don't want to uh, create a new NSG. We have that already created for us. So again, if we click on the advanced tab, you will notice now we have our network security group that we've just created called NSG lab. So make sure in the configure network security group settings that you click in that box and you select that NSG lab group. 
that we uh, created. I'm gonna go ahead and click next on management. I'm going to disable boot diagnostics. Click next on advanced, click next on tagging, click next to review and create. This will go away and do a validation process. If everything is in order, we should get a green uh, check mark here. Click create, and this will go away and create that virtual machine for us and put it in that network security group that we have just created. So we'll just wait for this virtual machine to go out and deploy. And as you can see, our virtual machine was successfully created. So let's navigate to our network security group by in the by clicking in the search menu at the top, just type in NSG and click network security group. And we should see our network security group here called uh, NSG lab. Now, if we click on our NSG lab, just to give you some more real estate, if you notice in the inbound rules, uh, you can see we have three rules for inbound and three rules for outbound. These are the default rules in Azure and they cannot be changed. Also bear in mind that the lowest uh, number in the rule will take priority. So when we create an RDP rule to allow us to access our VM, that will probably be rule number one. And rule number one will take precedence over the higher rules. So just bear that in mind. Also, these default rules cannot be modified or deleted. So again, these are our inbound rules and our security outbound rules. So let's navigate back to our virtual machine. Let's click on our virtual machine. Once we have clicked on our virtual machine, let's actually click the connect button, click RDP, and then let's download that RDP file. Now that RDP file is gonna download, I'm just gonna open it up, and it's opened up on another window. I'm gonna click connect, and uh, it's opening up on another window, and I wanna show you, we should not be able to connect. We should actually get an error because we haven't allowed RDP access. So let's just give this a second to uh, cycle through and hopefully we should see that error. And there we go, we are getting an error. And this error is saying that the remote access to the server is not enabled or the remote computer is turned off or the remote computer is not available on the network. We know all of the, the network is up. We know the server is up and we know that the remote computer is available. So what we need to do now is we need to go into our rules and allow RDP access so that we can access that virtual machine. So I'm going to close that down and just close this down and we're going to navigate back to our NSG. So click at the top and type in NSG. Let's navigate to our network security group. Click the NSG lab. Let's get some more real estate. Now let's go and add an outbound rule. So I'm going to go ahead and add a rule. So I'm going to click on the outbound rules underneath settings. Click add and from the drop down underneath the service, I'm going to select RDP and then I'm going to go ahead and give this rule a name so that I know what it is. So I'm going to go ahead and just type that in there and I'll just type in again uh, a name and you can see the priority is 100. So I'm going to go ahead and click add and it's going to go ahead and add uh, that rule into our security rules. And we can go into this rule if we needed to, and we could edit it, we could modify it, we could delete it from here. So now we've added that rule. So let's go and see if we can connect again to our virtual machine without any errors. Make sure you click the refresh button. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on my RDP client to try and connect. It's popped up on another window. I'm gonna click connect and we're just gonna wait and see if that will allow us to connect. So it's sitting there and it's thinking about it. So let's just give it a second and see what happens. And as you can see, we are getting still an error. We still cannot connect to our virtual machines. So that need, means we need to go and add an inbound rule to allow us to connect. So let's click OK. Again, in our network security group, underneath settings, go to inbound rules and let's go and add an inbound rule to allow 
RDP access. So click Add from the service, scroll down and select RDP. I'm going to go ahead and call this inbound and I'm going to give it a description as well. Inbound rule 01. I'm going to go ahead and click Add and just give it a second to add that inbound rule. And there we go, that inbound rule has been added there. Again, if you go to the bell notification icon at the top here, this will tell you everything that's happened. So I'm going to dismiss all of those. And now we've added that inbound rule. So the next thing we want to do is again, is we want to try and see if we can connect to our virtual machine. So I'm going to hit refresh just to make sure that everything's all good. I'm going to go back to my RDP client and I'm going to say connect. I'm going to bring it over here and click connect. And as you can see, it's now prompting me for a username and password. So I'm going to go ahead and type in my username. I'm going to type in my password. I'm going to go ahead and press enter. I'm getting a certificate warning. Sorry, I've got two screens, so it's opening up on the other screen. So I'm just dragging it across. I'm going to go ahead and click yes. And it's opened up on my other screen. So I'm just going to drag it over. And you can see we now have successfully managed to connect to our Azure virtual machine just by adding some rules in the network security group uh, rules section. So again, this uh, training lab is designed to get you familiar with creating a network security group for your organization from the ground up. And there we go. We can access our virtual machine and we can do all the things that we need to do. I'm just going to close this down. So now again, like I say, remember the lowest rule takes priority. And if you have a look here, we've got a warning on this rule, like a sort of like an orange triangle. If you click on that orange triangle and you scroll down to the bottom, it kind of tells you that RDP port is exposed to the internet. Try to use a VPN for uh, connecting or mask that. So that's just uh, like I say, you are going to see that warning. But in the case of this lab we're doing, you don't need to worry. If you want to de deny access, we could go ahead and click deny and we could go ahead and click save. And if I went back into my uh, remote desktop client and I tried to um, connect, I would get a, an error because we've denied that rule. And you can see that rule has been denied. I'm going to hit refresh to and just give it a, a few seconds quickly to update. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to try and connect to that virtual machine again. So we'll just give it a second to update. So I think that's updated. So I'm going to double click. I'm going to try and connect now to that uh, virtual machine. I'm going to click connect and it's opening up on another window. And we should get a denied uh, access or we should get an error popping up saying that we don't have access to access that virtual machine. And that's because we have denied the RDP rule. So again, your network security groups are used for filtering rules. It's a basic firewall in Azure and it comes free. So thank you so much for Microsoft. So there you go. You can see now our access has been denied. And like I say, we can go through and we can associate subnets. We could add subnets. If I wanted to associate a subnet, I would click associate. I would click in the drop down menu and select that NSG lab uh, subnet and I would click OK and that would go ahead and add that subnet for me uh, to here to associate it with that network security group and you can see here that's uh, it's associated as well I can go into the, the properties and I could get more information about that security group I could gather logs uh, about what's going on with that security group so again network security groups are a great way to keep your resources secure and I do encourage you to try and use network security groups in your environment. So again, that completes this lab. So I'd like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next lab. Hi, welcome to Azure Security uh, Bastion host in a nutshell. So what is Azure Bastion? Well, Azure Bastion is a fully uh, managed platform PaaS service that provides RDP and SSH uh, over TLS port 443 to all the VMs in the network. Azure Bastion protects your virtual machines from exposing that RDP port and SSH ports and other IPs addresses to the outside world while still providing secure access using that RDP and SSH. 
and you connect to Azure Bastion using a web browser. With Azure Bastion, you connect the virtual machine directly from the Azure portal, and you don't need any additional client or agent or a piece of software to run it. Again, why use Bastion? Well, a Bastion host is a server whose purpose is to provide uh, access to a private network from the external network, such as the internet. Because of its exposure to a potential attack, a Bastion host must minimize the chances of penetration testing and people trying to scan your environment to uh, obviously do bad things. So Bastion host is a really good uh, piece of security that you should have in your network if possible. To learn more about Azure Bastion, I encourage you to go to the Microsoft link below, and this will give you a more in-depth uh, view of where you can use Bastion, how you can use Bastion, and what else you can do with Bastion. That being said, let's go ahead and deploy Azure Bastion in a live lab. Hi, and welcome back. In this uh, training session, we are going to learn how to create a Bastion host from the ground up. So go ahead and log into your portal. Once you've logged into your portal, navigate to resource groups and let's create a new resource group and let's call this resource group Bastion. So I'm going to call that resource group Bastion, click review and create, click create. This will go away and create that resource group for us. Once that resource group has been created, the next thing we need to do is to create a network. So navigate to virtual networks, click create. Let's put that virtual network in that Bastion resource group. Let's give it a name. I'm just going to call mine Bastion Network. Go next on IP addresses. On the default IP address, let's go ahead and let's change that um, subnet to Bastion subnet. So I've got it in Notepad, so I'm just copying and pasting across. And then I'm going to go ahead and click Save and save that uh, in there. Then I'm going to go ahead and click Next on Security. And we are going to enable Bastion Host. And I'm going to give it a name. So I'm going to call mine Bastion Server. You can call yours whatever you like. So I'm just pasting a name in there. And I'm going to go ahead and paste in an IP address. Obviously, you'd have to look at your IP address range to make sure it doesn't overlap. And then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make sure DOS protection is off and the firewall is off. I'm going to click Create New because I want to create a new public IP address. And I'm going to call this public IP address Bastion PIP, short for Bastion Public IP. So I'm just going to copy and paste this in there. This is all in Notepad. So I'm going to accept the defaults and click OK. I'm going to go next on Tagging. I'm not going to worry about tagging. I'm going to go next to Review and Create. And then that's going to go away and do a validation process. And then I'm going to go ahead and click Create. Now, I want you to bear in mind, when you create your Bastion host, it can take anywhere from about 5 to 10 minutes to deploy. So we'll just wait for this to deploy. And then once it's deployed, we'll come back. Again, the deployment could be quicker. It all depends on your network and your resources. So we'll just wait for this deployment to complete. And as you can see, that took about uh, 10 minutes for our Bastion host to be deployed. So if we navigate back to our resource group and we click on our Bastion resource group, we can see our Bastion server has been deployed. So the next thing we need to do is we need to deploy a virtual machine. So go ahead and click Virtual Machines. Let's click Create. From the drop down, select, create, uh, select Azure Virtual Machine. Then let's go ahead and put it into that Bastion group. And I'll just call this Bastion VM. I'm going to accept all the defaults. I'm going to go ahead and give it a username and password. Type the password in again. I'm going to go ahead and select disks. I'm going to select standard SSD. I'm going to go next to networking. 
Now, when we get to networking, we don't want to create a new public IP because we have a public IP address already. So go ahead and uh, click in the public IP and say none. Accept all the defaults. Let's go next. Let's disable boot diagnostics. Let's turn off the time. Click next on advanced. Click next on tagging. Click next to review and create. This will go away and do a validation for us. If we've done everything correctly, we should get a nice green bar at the top or a check mark. If that happens, go ahead and click create. If not, it'll turn red and it'll highlight underneath whether you have a disk problem or a networking problem. In our case, everything is okay. So go ahead and click create. And this will go now and deploy that virtual machine for us. And we'll just wait a short while for that machine to deploy and then we'll connect to it using Bastion. So as you can see, it didn't take long for our virtual machine to deploy. So go ahead and uh, click go to resource. Click the connect button and then click Bastion. Go ahead and type in our username. In our case, it was AZ admin. I'm going to go ahead and type in that password. And then click connect. And this will now connect us to that bastion using a web browser. As you can see here, our web browser is kicking in. We're getting a pop-up, so we are going to say allow. And there we go. Our Windows server is allowing us to connect. So we are actually connecting to our Windows server via a bastion host. So we'll give this a second to uh, log in, and then we'll carry on with the lab. And there we go, our server has kicked in. And as you can see, we can work within our server as we normally would. And I'm just gonna click no. And if you'll notice the background is black, that's because we can't change some of the settings due to the remote desktop uh, session taking place. But again, like I say, this allows us to do so many cool things. And we're connecting to it via a web browser, therefore masking our IP address from outside um, access so people won't be able to see that. If I click on this little arrow on the side here, this will bring up a clipboard where I can copy and paste stuff between our clipboard. So while our Bastion host is firing up, I'm just going to jump back into the Azure portal and I'm actually going to go back to my uh, Windows virtual machine and just show you a few things. If I click on the overview, you'll notice my public IP address is masked. It's hidden and that's because we are connecting via Bastion. So again, if I click on my Bastion uh, web browser link, you can see the service firing up and it's allowing me to connect. So that's how you connect using Bastion. So I'm gonna go ahead and log off and click disconnect. This is gonna tell me, are you sure you wanna disconnect? I'm gonna say yes, I'm gonna close that down and now I'm back at my virtual machine. So that's how you use Bastion. I'd like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next lab. Welcome to this video, Azure Security in a Nutshell. And in this section, we're gonna talk about disk encryption. So what is Azure Disk Encryption? Well, Azure Disk Encryption helps protect and safeguard your data to meet your organizational security and compliance commitments. The ADE encrypts the OS data on the disk of the Azure Virtual VM inside your VM using the CPU of your VM through the use of a feature called DM Crypt uh, of Linux or BitLocker feature of Windows. It's important that Azure uh, Disk Encryption does not store recovery keys. Azure Disk Encryption types, we have server-side encryption, also referred to as encryption at rest or Azure Storage Encryption. It automatically encrypts data stored on the Azure Managed Disk or the OS and Data Disk when uh, persisting on that storage cluster. Then we have encryption at host, ensures that the data stored on the VM host, hosting your VM is encrypted at rest and uh, flows that uh, encrypted to the storage cluster. Encryption is part of a layered uh, approach of security and should be used with other recommendations to secure your virtual machines and their disks. So 
why use Azure uh, Disk Encryption? Well, Azure Disk Encryption helps protect and safeguard your data. Again, like I said earlier on, to meet your security and compliance commitments. Of course, uh, the Azure Disk uh, Encryption requires an Azure Key Vault to control and manage disk en encryption and keys. Your Key Vault and VMs must reside in the same region and the same subscription. So if you want to set up Azure Disk Encryption, you first have to create a Key Vault and then you can go ahead and encrypt your disk. So terminology, Key Vault. Key Vault is a cryptographic key management service that is based on the Federation Information Processing Standards validated hardware and security modules. These standards help safeguard your cryptographic keys and sensitive uh, secrets. BitLocker. BitLocker is an industry recognized Windows volume encryption technology that is used to enable disk encryption on Windows VMs. Then we have something called an asymmetric key, an asymmetric key, uh, RSA uh, 2048, that you can use to protect or wrap that secret. You can provide a hardware security module or a protected key or a software protected key. Then we have the Azure CLI, and it's optimized for managing and administrating Azure resources from the command line. Uh, again, this is also built into the portal and you can navigate to that by uh, selecting Cloud Shell and you can choose whether you want to use uh, both Bash or PowerShell. Again, to learn more about Azure Disk Encryption, I encourage you to go and have a look at the link below. This will give you some more in-depth uh, knowledge where you can go ahead and see how you can deploy uh, disk encryption in your environment. That being said, let's bounce straight into our live lab and let's go and encrypt a VM disk. Right, as you can see, I've gone ahead and I've logged into the portal. So in this lab, we want to learn how to encrypt our VM. And this is all done through Cloud Shell. So navigate to Cloud Shell and click this icon at the top here. This will open up Cloud Shell. And as you can see, we're in Bash. So the first thing we need to do is we need to create a resource group. So I'm going to paste in a command and read this to you. This command is az group create, create a resource group called encrypted VMs and put it in the East US location. And I'm going to go ahead and press enter. And that's going to go ahead and create that resource group for us. I'm going to go ahead at the bottom and just type in clear. So we've got some more real estate. And the next thing we need to do now is to create our virtual machine itself. So I'm going to go ahead again and paste these commands in. I have this uh, in Notepad, but you can type this out. That's absolutely fine. As you can see, we're saying azvm create. Let's create a virtual machine and let's put it in the encrypted VMs resource group. Let's name that virtual machine WinVM. Let's give it a Windows 2016 data center image. Let's give it the username azuser and let's give it a password of p at sswrd1234. Obviously, in the real world, you would not do that. Once you've got your commands in there, just go ahead and press enter. And this will go away and create that virtual machine for us. And it'll just take a few minutes to create. So we'll just wait while this virtual machine creates and deploys. And as you can see, it didn't take too long to uh, deploy that virtual machine. Again, at the bottom, just type in clear so we get some real estate. Now we've created our resource group. We've created a virtual machine and put it in that resource group. So the next thing we need to do is we need to create a key vault. And a key vault is where we install all of our encryption keys, our certificates, and our secrets. So again, I've got a command here. I'm just going to paste this command in because I have it written in Notepad. So I'm going to paste that out and read it to you. So again, we're saying az key vault create. Create a key vault called encrypted VMs key vault. Let's put that key vault in the encrypted VMs resource group. Let's put it in the East U, uh, in the East US location, and let's enable that disk for encryption. So I'm going to go ahead and press Enter, and that's going to go away and create that key vault for us. And as you can see, it's uh, creating it for us. It won't take too long, so we'll just wait for that key vault to uh, complete its creation. And as you can see, it's gone ahead and it's created that key vault already for us. So I'm going to go ahead and type in clear at the bottom here. So we've got some more real estate. So the next thing we need to do is we actually now can encrypt our virtual machine. So I'm going to go ahead and paste this command in and read it to you before I press enter so that you can understand what it is. So I'm just going to paste this in. Again, I'm pasting it in from Notepad. 
So as you can see, it says AZ VM encryption enable. Enable encryption on the resource group encrypted VMs. Encrypt that VM named WinVM and put the encryption key in the encrypted VM key vault. And I'm going to go ahead and press enter. And this is now going to go ahead and encrypt that uh, virtual machine. Again, it shouldn't take too long to encrypt. It's pretty quick. So we'll just wait for that encryption to take place. And as you can see, the Key Vault encryption has uh, now encrypted that uh, VM and copied that secret key up. So the next thing we want to do is we want to actually make sure that our VM has been encrypted. So we can run this other little command here, and this will show us what VMs have been encrypted. Again, I'm just going to paste this command in. I've got it all typed out in Notepad. So we're saying VM encryption show the name of the VM we encrypted and the resource group where that virtual machine has been encrypted and we would press enter and as you can see we can go down and it tells us here the encryption state is encrypted it's encrypted the enabled encryption on the disk sorry and you can see it has succeeded so how do we know for sure it has been encrypted I mean we can see this in cloud shell but how do we see this physically well let's go ahead and let's hit refresh and as you can see there's that resource group we created if I click on that resource group, you can see here these all the VMs and the key vaults that were created. So let's go ahead and navigate to our virtual machines and let's go and log on and see what's actually taken place. So I'm going to click on my Windows VM and if I scroll down, you can see here it says that the disk has been enabled, encryption is enabled on this Azure disk. So let's go ahead and connect downloading uh, RDP this will then allow us to, to download that RDP client we download that RDP client and I'm going to click open I'm going to go ahead and log in to this VM I'm just going to type in my username and then that password I'm getting a certificate warning, that's fine. Sorry, my um, VM's opening up on a second screen. Once it's opened up, I'll drag it over and then we can actually see what's taken place on our virtual machine. So we'll just give it a second to uh, open up. And it's opened up on another window. So I'm just gonna drag this over so that we've got some more real estate and just give it a second to load up. And there you go, you can see our VM has now fired up. And again, we'll just wait for it to finish uh, loading. If I click um, on File Explorer, we'll go and explore those disks and see if those disks have been encrypted. So we'll just give it another second or two to complete its loading. And as you can see here, I'm getting an error. Uh, I'm getting a message, sorry, saying that encryption is in progress. I'm gonna go ahead and close this down. And I'm going to go ahead and close down server manager because we don't need it. And I'm going to navigate to file explorer. I'm going to navigate to this PC. And if you notice, once I've clicked on this PC, we've got two padlocks here. And these two padlocks tell us that this VM has been encrypted. So by looking at those padlocks, we know that encryption has taken place. Again, I can close this to log out and we can move over and go to Key Vault and see what's happening on Key Vault as well. So I can go to the top here and type in KEY and select Key Vault. There's our Key Vault. Let's open up our Key Vault and let's just explore it. And if I come down to Access Policies, you can see here, I have a checkbox saying Azure Disk Encryption for Volume Encrypted. So this tells us that our virtual machine has been encrypted. So we can see that as well. We can go over and click on Keys. We'll just wait for that to fire up. And we can click on Secrets. And you can see there's our secret. There's that encryption key 
that uh, has been set up for us. And you can see there it is. Let's put it in the key vault. And again, we can click over here and we can show the secret type and then we can copy that if we need to. So that's how you encrypt a virtual machine from the ground up. Again, at the end of the day, whenever you finish your training, it's always good to go and clean up your labs. So we can do that two ways. We can clean, uh, remove that resource group using Bash, or we can remove that resource group using um, the portal. So I'm going to close this down, and we can go ahead and open up Cloud Shell again and just type in clear. So we've got some real estate. Now we can go ahead and delete that resource group. And that resource group, before we delete it, I'll just navigate to it and just show you quickly. So if I click on that resource group, encrypted VMs, you will see inside that resource group, we have everything uh, that's associated with that virtual machine. So we want to delete that resource group so that we can go ahead and create other labs as we move through our training. So I'm going to go ahead and delete this resource group using Bash as well. So I'm just, I've just got a command here. I'm going to go ahead and open up Bash. I'm going to paste this command in here. And it's a very simple command. It's az group delete and delete the name of the group. So the name of the resource group we want to delete is called uh, encrypted VM. So I'm going to uh, paste that in and just press enter. This is confirming. Are you sure you want to do this? So I'm going to say Y for yes and press enter. And this is going to go away and it's going to delete that resource group. And that shouldn't take too long. We'll just wait for that resource group to uh, finish uh, deleting and then we'll go back into the portal and confirm that it has been removed. And as you can see, we're back at the bash prompt and we don't have any errors. So that means our resource group has been uh, deleted or removed successfully. So let's close Cloud Shell. Let's close down this window and let's go ahead and hit refresh. And our encrypted VMs has disappeared. If you want to delete a resource group from the portal, again, we can click on Net Network Watcher. We can right mouse it and highlight it and click and then click the delete resource group button paste that um, name of that resource group in there and click delete now the network watcher is created by default in azure because it allows us to actually do monitoring and stuff if we need to so again we'll just wait for that to complete its uh, removal and then we'll carry on with the lab it shouldn't take too long and as you can see, we've got a nice notification here from our bell icon telling us that that resource group was removed successfully. So I'm going to go ahead and click Dismiss All to close that down. If we navigate to our virtual machines, you'll see we have no virtual machines at all. If I go ahead and type in KEY and let's go to our key vaults and hit uh, Refresh, you'll notice now we don't have any key vaults. So that covers this lab on encryption. And again, just to give you an overview of what we've done, we created a resource group. We created a virtual machine. We then encrypted that virtual machine in that resource group. We created a key vault to hold the secret keys. And then we went into both the RDP session and had a look at the encrypted status. We also had a look at the encrypted status via Cloud Shell as well. And we also had a look at the encrypted status via the virtual machine console as well in Azure by scrolling down and having a look at your OS disk to see whether it was encrypted. So that completes this lab. I'd like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next lab. Hi, welcome to Azure Security Firewall in a Nutshell. So what is an Azure Firewall? Well, an Azure Firewall is a cloud native and is an intelligent network firewall security service that provides the best of breed threat protection for your cloud workloads running in Azure. It's a fully stateful firewall as a service with built-in high availability and unrestricted cloud scalability. So what are SKUs? Well, a SKU is short for stock keeping unit. It basically stands for an item which is on sale in layman's language. In terms of Microsoft Azure Cloud, they basically signify a purchasable SKU under the product, and it has a bunch of different shapes for the product. So what are the versions? Well, Azure Firewall has two versions. We have the standard and the premium. Well, the standard Azure Firewall provides a level, a layer three and a layer seven filtering and threat intelligence feeds 
directly from the Microsoft Cybersecurity Center. The threat intelligence based filtering can alert or deny traffic to and from known malicious IP addresses, domains, and where they are updated in real time to protect against any new and emerging attacks. So let's break these versions down a bit more. So what does premium do? Well, the Azure Premium uh, provides advanced capabilities that, that include signature-based IDPS to allow rapid detection of attacks by looking for specific patterns. These patterns can include byte sequences in network traffic or known malicious instruction sequences used by malware. There are more than 58,000 signatures in over 50 categories which are updated in real time to protect against new and emerging exploits. The exploit categories include malware, phishing, coin mining, and Trojan attacks, and so much more. Again, the Azure Firewall Manager, what is it? Well, the Azure Firewall Manager is used to centrally manage firewall access across multiple subscriptions. The Firewall Manager leverages the firewall policy to apply a common set of network application rules and configurations to the firewall in your tenant. The Firewall Manager supports firewalls both on the VNet and virtual WANs and the secure virtual hub environments. To learn more about Azure Firewall, I encourage you to go to the link below and that will give you more information and give you some in-depth uh, info on how you can use Azure Firewall in your environment. So I'd like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the lab when we deploy an Azure Firewall. Hi and welcome to this lab deploying an Azure Firewall. So as you can see I've navigated to my resource group. I want you to click the create button. Let's give our resource group a name. I'm going to call mine Azure Firewall Lab and I'm going to leave it in the East US location. Click review and create. This will go away and do a validation and click create. This will go away and create that resource group for us. Once that resource group has been created we will go and put our Azure Firewall and everything related to the firewall in that resource group. So the next thing we need to do is we need to go to the top and type in firewalls or firewall. And you'll see there it brings up Azure Firewalls. Now I'm in the Azure Firewalls blade. Go ahead and click Create. Make sure you put that uh, in the Azure Firewall Lab resource group. Now it's asking us to give our Azure Firewall an instance name. So I'm just going to call mine AZ Firewall Lab. I'm going to paste that in there because I've got stuff written out in Notepad. And the region is really important. Make sure it's in the same region that your resource group is in. And I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to select Standard as our firewall. And then I'm going to select Firewall Management. I'm going to use Classic Rules. And then I'm going to go in and give my firewall as a virtual network a name. So I'm going to go ahead and just paste the name in here that I have in Notepad. And I'm going to accept the default IP ranges because we just want to learn how to deploy our firewall. So I'm just going to go ahead and paste those ranges in there. And I'm going to do that same again with that subnet as well. I'm just going to copy and paste. So we have that same subnet in there. Then I'm going to scroll down and I'm going to add a new public IP. So we need to do that because that's how we are going to connect to our firewall. So I'm going to click New. I'm going to paste in a name, uh, AZFW, short for Azure Firewall Public IP. I'm going to click OK. I'm going to click Review and Create. This is going to go away and do that validation process for us. And then I'm going to, then I'm going to go ahead and click Create. Now this can take anywhere from five to ten minutes to deploy, depending on your Azure resources. So I'm just going to wait for this to deploy. It shouldn't take too long. And as you can see, that didn't take too long for that deployment to complete. So the next thing we need to do is we need to go and add a subnet to this firewall because our virtual machine is going to use the subnet to connect to the firewall. So navigate over to virtual networks, click on your virtual network. 
Then scroll down underneath settings, click subnets. I'm just going to close this to get more uh, real estate. Click add subnet. I'm going to go ahead and paste the name in. I'm going to call mine AZFWVM subnet. I'm going to accept the defaults and click save. This will add the subnet for us. And if you notice, we already have a subnet there called Azure Firewall subnet. This is the default subnet that we can't, that we cannot change. So once we've created our subnet, the next thing we need to do is we need to go and deploy our virtual machine into that resource group so that we can use that subnet. So navigate over to virtual machines, click create, select virtual machine, make sure you put it in the Azure lab resource group. I'm going to give my virtual machine a name. I'm just going to paste this in. I've got it in Notepad just to save time. And I'm going to leave it in the East US. I'm going to select a Windows 2016 data center. I'm going to go ahead and give my user a name. So I'm going to just type in AZ, all lowercase, sorry. Type in the password. Type in the password again. Under uh, public inbound ports, select none. Click next on disks. From the disk OS type, I'm going to select from the drop down standard because we don't need premium, it's just a lab. Click next on networking. And if you notice, we are actually in the Azure AZ Firewall VNet and we are in that subnet that we created. So I'm going to go ahead and go next underneath management. I'm going to disable boot diagnostics and disable auto shutdown. Click next. Click review and create. This will go away and do a validation process. Once the validation has completed, we're going to go ahead and click the create button to deploy that virtual machine into our Azure firewall. So we'll just give it a second to deploy. Again, depending on your environment and your resources, this can take anywhere from five to 10 minutes. Again, uh, it all depends on your network. So we'll just wait for that to uh, deploy out and complete. It shouldn't take too long. And as you can see, our virtual machine has completed its deployment. I'm going to close this down and I'll click go to resource. So the next thing we actually want to do is we want to go ahead and create a route table. And we'll do this in the next video. So I look forward to seeing you in the next part of the lab. Right, the next thing we want to do is we want to go and add a route table. So in the top, in the search area, just type in ROU and select route tables. Once you are in the route table blade, click create. In the resource group, make sure you select your Azure Firewall Lab resource group. Make sure it's in the East US location, otherwise you will have issues. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to give my route table a name. I'm just going to paste the name in there. I can call it FE route table, or you might want to change the name to route uh, table FW, short for firewall. Click review and create. Click create. This will go away and create that route table for us. Once that route table has deployed, we'll go in and uh, associate that route table with our subnet. So we'll just give it a second to deploy. So our route table has uh, deployed. So click go to resource and then go to uh, underneath your settings. Let's go to subnets, click associate. From the drop down, select the Azure Firewall Lab and do the same thing on the subnet. Select the AZ Firewall subnet. So we've selected our virtual network and we've selected our AZ uh, VM subnet and click OK. And this will go away and associate those subnets with that routing table. And we'll just give that a second to deploy out. And again, as you can see, it has uh, deployed completely. So now that our subnet and everything has been associated, if we click on our AVM subnet, you can see here it's all been associated with that correct routing table. 
So what we want to do is in the next video, we are going to learn how to add some settings to our route table and to our firewall appliance. And I look forward to seeing you in the so next lab. I've navigated to my routing table. And if you're not too sure how I got there, just go to the top and type in RO, select routing tables, select our route table. And this takes me to my route table blade. And as you can see, our subnets have been associated. So the next thing we need to do is we need to create a route. So click on routes, click add. I'm going to call this route AZ route. And for the destination, I'm going to use an IP address. Now for the IP address, I'm just going to type in or paste in an IP range. Uh, of 0, .0, .0, 0.0.0.0. .0. This will allow uh, everything through. Now the next hop that we want to put in there is going to be our Azure Firewall. So we want to click the drop down and select Virtual Appliance. Now this address here is where we need to put in the IP address of the Azure Firewall. So how do we find this? Where do we actually go to get this? So normally what I would do is I would uh, copy all of this and I would say copy and I'd open up a new section in Azure and paste that in there and press enter because I'd like to have two sections to work with. I'm going to log back in again. And now in this section here, we want to get our firewalls uh, private IP address. So I'll just type in fire. I'm going to go to my firewall. I'm going to click on my firewall here and I can see here, here's my Azure firewalls private IP address. So I'm going to click copy. I'm going to go back over and I'm going to paste that in there. And then I'm going to go ahead and click add. And that's going to add and associate that routing table with uh, that firewall appliance. So once our routing table has been added, the next thing we want to do is if we click on our AZ route, you can see here this gives us our virtual appliance. So I'm going to go back to our routing tables. I'm going to select my routing table again. I'm going to just close that down to get more real estate. So we, we can now confirm everything is all in place over here. So the next thing we need to do is we need to navigate back to our firewall appliance. So I'm going to type in FIR, select firewalls, select my firewall appliance. Then I'm going to close this down to get more uh, real estate. So now we can go ahead and add in some rules. So I'm going to go ahead and click uh, Rules, Classic. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to work through these rules. As you can see, we've got a NAT rule, we've got a network rule, and we've got an application rule. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to learn how to add an application rule. So again, make sure you've got application rule um, collection highlighted. Click Add Application Rule Collection. And here is where we go and add our application rule collection. So I'm going to type in allow Google because it's going to be a Google rule. I'm going to give it a priority of 200. Remember the lowest priority will always take uh, precedence. So the next thing we need to do is come down to the target FQDNs and let's go ahead and type in a name. So I'm going to say allow Google. I'm going to make sure I select IP address. I'm going to say from any source because that's absolutely fine. Now I'm going to go ahead and type in the port protocols. And if you have a look here, you can see we've got a few that we need to do. So I'm going to say uh, just paste these rules in. And that's going to be uh, HTTP, HTTPS, and of course uh, SSL. So I'm going to go ahead and type in Google. I'm going to go www.google.com. And then I'm just going to confirm I've got a tick box everywhere and I'm going to go ahead and click add and that's going to go away and update that fire rule or that application rule in our firewall. And again, that can take a few minutes to uh, update. It doesn't happen instantly. So let's just give that a, a minute or so to complete. And as you can see, that uh, rule has completed and you can see here our rule has been added. So that concludes this part of the video. In the next lab, we will learn how to create a network rule collection. As you can see, we have created our application rule. So click network rule collection.
click add network rule collection and I'm going to go and add a DNS rule to allow DNS so click allow DNS I'm going to put in a priority number of 200 now in the rule names over here I'm going to again type in allow DNS for the protocol I'm going to select UDP I'm going to select IP address and then for the source I'm going to select my uh, IP range uh, subnet of my VM so how do we do that again navigate to that other tab we had open go back to our virtual networks click on virtual lab click subnets and there's that subnet that we want so if I click on that subnet you can see that is exactly what we want so I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to copy that and then I'm going to go back to my source and I'm going to paste that in again the destination type again I'm going to select IP address and the destination address the destination sorry the destination address is going to be our public DNS so that could be a Microsoft DNS it could be a Google DNS it could be whatever DNS you wanted it to be so I'm going to go ahead and add that DNS address of Google which is 8.8.8 uh, .8 .8, sorry dot eight dot eight and I'm going to use a comma and add another address because there's always two and I'm going to go add 8.8.4.4 .4. and I'm going to type in there 53 that's the port for DNS and as you can see I've got check marks all the way through so again the name is allowed DNS we want to allow UDP traffic that's for uh, again DNS to work we want to go by an IP address I want to select my subnet IP range for my virtual machine for the IP address for the destination I've typed in the Google DNS addresses and again we're going to go over port 53 so I'm going to go ahead and click add and that's going to add that network rule uh, in here for us and again please bear in mind it's not a doesn't add it straight away so we'll just wait for this rule to add it can take anywhere from three to five minutes depending on your network connection and as you can see now our public DNS um, rule has been added for our uh, Google DNS I'm going to hit the refresh just to make sure so that's fantastic so the next part of the lab is we're going to go and create a NAT rule so this completes this section of the lab and I look forward to seeing you in the next video so the next thing we want to do before we add that NAT rule is to add a custom DNS so how do we do that well I'm going to click on this other tab I had open over here I'm going to close this down I'm going to scroll back down to networks I'm going to go ahead and select my network I'm going to then move over and select my subnets and then once I'm in my subnets blade I'm going to go to settings and then click connected devices and then I'm going to click on my Azure network interface or firewall appliance I'm going to click on that and I'm going to go ahead and underneath DNS servers under settings click on DNS servers click custom and I'm going to add that custom DNS servers of Google which was 8.8.8.8 and I'm going to add another one which is 8.8.4.4 uh, .4 and click save and what this will do this will go ahead and save those custom DNS uh, addresses that we need so that our firewall knows where to go so again that can take a, a minute or two to deploy out so let's just wait for that deployment to complete and as you can see that saved it it didn't take too long to complete and that completes this part of the lab in the next part of the lab we will actually navigate back to our Azure uh, firewall rules and we'll now go and add that NAT, that NAT rule so I look forward to seeing you in the next video as you can see I've logged back into my Azure firewall lab so I'm under rules and classic so we've created an application rule we've created a network rule now we need to create a NAT rule so click on NAT rule collection click add NAT rule collection and then I'm going to give that rule a name I'm going to call it RDP I'm going to give it a priority number of 200 you can give it whatever priority number you would like I'm going to say RDP I'm going to select the TCP as the protocol I'm going to select an IP address 
and then I'm going to just type in a wildcard for any IP. Now in the destination address, that's my Azure Firewall's uh, public IP address. So I'm going to navigate back to my uh, uh, Azure Firewall. So in the top there, just go and type in F-I-R-E, select Firewalls, click your Azure Firewall and click under Settings, click IP Configuration. There's our public IP address. So I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to go ahead and copy that public IP address. I'm going to bounce back and I'm going to paste it in the destination address. I'm going to use the port of 3389. Now in our translated address, we actually want to add in the private IP address of our virtual machine. So how do we find that? Again, I'm going to use this tab at the top. I'm going to go to virtual machines. I'm going to select my virtual machine and you can see my private IP address is 10.0.1.4. So I can move back. I can type in 10.0.1.4. I'm going to say I'm going to connect over 3389. And then I'm going to go ahead and click add. And that's going to add that NAT rule for me. And please bear in mind that again can take a few minutes to update. It doesn't happen instantly. So we'll just wait for that NAT rule to complete. And as you can see now, it didn't take too long and that NAT rule has completed. Again, you can always look at the bell notification at the top here and this will tell you what was successful and what failed or what errors you've got. And then you can go away and do some troubleshooting. So I'm gonna dismiss all that. Now, the next thing we need to do is we need to bounce back over to our virtual machine. We need to click on our virtual machine and we need to restart our virtual machine. So I'm going to go ahead and restart that VM and say yes. And that's going to restart that virtual machine. Once that virtual machine has restarted, we will then uh, navigate to that virtual machine and see if our firewall is working. And as you can see, our virtual machine has restarted successfully. We can see that from the notification area. So I'm going to go ahead and close that down. So the next thing we want to do is we want to connect to our virtual machine, but we are going to connect using the public firewalls IP address. So we are going to grab this public firewalls IP address. I'm going to copy that and I'm going to open up remote desktop and I'm just going to paste that IP address in there. I'm going to click the connect button. And this is going to prompt me for a username and password. So I'm going to type in my username and password for my virtual machine. I'm going to go ahead and type in that password and click connect. I'm going to accept this certificate because you can see there's my AZFWVM. Click yes. And this will allow me now to connect to that virtual machine. So we'll just give it a few seconds to remote in. And as you can see, it's allowing us to connect. I'm just going to click no for now. And I'm just going to wait for server manager to complete its load up. And then I want to show you a little tip that will uh, help you so that when we test our firewall, we're not going to be prompted every single time to enter an address with our web browser. So we'll just wait for the server to load. It shouldn't take too long. And as you can see, it, it's loaded. So click on local servers. And then we want to go and turn off enhanced IE security because this can be quite painful and it can prompt you for uh, every time when you open up a web page. So I'm just going to turn this off for now. It's because it's a lab. I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And I'm going to go ahead and hit the refresh button at the top here. And this is going to confirm that it's been turned off. And I'm going to go ahead and close this down. So I'm going to open up our Internet Explorer. And I'm going to see if our firewall is actually working. So one of the first things we want to do is we want to actually go in and see if we can connect to uh, say Google. So I'm just going to click um, uh, OK on this warning. So I'm going to drag this down and I'm just going to make this web page a little bit bigger. And I'm going to go ahead and type in www.google.com and press enter. 
So as you can see, I've typed in the Google address and it's brought up Google for us. So if I type in Azure, I can navigate using Google no problem at all. So if I decided to come to the top here and type in, say, uh, www.youtube.com and press enter, you can see here it says the action was denied and we do not have uh, access to that uh, particular website. Again, you may probably say, well, I've typed it in wrong over there. I'll bring this back and just prove to you and press enter. Again, we get the same thing as well. Even if you typed in facebook.com, you wouldn't be able to connect. But if I went into that address and I deleted it and I typed in www. Uh, Google dot com and press enter you can see we can navigate to Google quite fine if I typed in YouTube I should be able to get to YouTube that's because we are going through a web browser that's allowed us accessed by the application rule in the Azure firewall so this completes this lab of how to deploy an Azure firewall I'd like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next lab Hi, welcome to Azure Security Just-in-Time Access. So what is Azure Just-in-Time Access or JIT? When enabled, Azure JIT locks down inbound traffic to your Azure VM by creating a rule in your network security group. The goal of JIT is, a, is to ensure that even though your inbound traffic is locked down, Defender for Cloud still provides easy access to connect to those VMs when needed. So why use uh, Azure JIT? Well, just-in-time access reduces the attack surface area by opening inbound ports just when you need them and are automatically closed after a specified duration or time that has elapsed. When you enable JIT for access, it adds an inbound rule. This deny rule blocks all traffic to port 3389. If you need access and you want to get into that VM remotely, you need to request access. Then that port will be open and then you'll be allowed access and then you can remote into that virtual machine. So what if you already have a rule on the inbound port that'll 43389? Well, the priority of the existing rule will be modified automatically. So a higher number than the deny rule will take place. Remember with the rules, the lower the priority, that uh, number wins. The higher the priority, that number loses. So for example, uh, 100 is lower than 110. So 110 would be blocked where 100 would allow me to get into the system. So how does um, Azure JIT work with network security groups? Well, Defender for Cloud ensures uh, that a deny all traffic rule exists in your selected ports in the network security group and the Azure Firewall rules. These rules restrict access to your VM management ports and defend them from attack. Note, JIT does not support VMs protected by Azure Firewall, controlled by Azure Firewall Manager. The Azure Firewall Manager must be configured with rules in the classic section, and these cannot use firewall policies. Again, what you need to know, it requires Microsoft Defender Service Plan 2 to be enabled on the subscription, and you need to have the reader and the security reader roles. They can both view the JIT status and their parameters. Again, I would encourage you to go out to the Microsoft website and see the link below. That'll give you more in-depth information about the Azure Just-in-Time Access. And you can learn how to deploy Azure Just-in-Time Access in your environment. And that being said, let's go ahead and deploy Azure JIT Live in our lab. And I'll see you shortly. Hi, as you can see, I've gone ahead and I've logged into the portal. So in order to enable Just-in-Time Access on a virtual machine, we need our resource group and we need a virtual machine. As you can see, if I click on my resource group that I've created prior called JIT, you can see I've got some virtual machines in there, but let's go and create a new virtual machine and put it in that resource group and enable Just-in-Time Access. So I'm gonna close that down. I'm gonna to navigate to Virtual Machines. I'm going to go ahead and click Create. From the drop-down menu, I'm gonna select Virtual Machine. I'm going to go ahead and put that virtual machine in that JIT resource group. I'm going to call this virtual machine uh, JIT002. I'm going to leave it in the East uh, uh, Australian uh, Asia Pacific region. For redundancy, 
if you do have uh, an availability zone selected, just click no redundancy required. I'm going to leave the security as standard for the image. I'm going to select a Windows 2016 data center and I'm going to go ahead and give my uh, virtual machine a username. So I'll just call it uh, azjit, make that all lowercase, az, azjit. I'm going to go ahead and give that azjit a password. I'm going to confirm that password. I'm going to go down to disks and click next. From the OS disk type, I'm going to click in the box there and select standard because this is a lab. We don't need to have a high performance disk. Click next on networking. I'm going to accept all the defaults and go next on management. I'm going to Disable boot diagnostics under monitoring and I'm going to turn off auto shutdown. Click next on the, to advance forward. Click next on tags. You're not going to worry about tagging. Click next to review and create. Again, this will go away and it will do a validation process. Once that validation process has completed, click create. Now this will go out and deploy that virtual machine for us. And this can take anywhere from one minute to five minutes. It all depends on your network. So we'll just wait for this uh, deployment to complete. It shouldn't take too long. And as you can see, our deployment has completed successfully. I'm just going to close this notification down and click go to resource. So as you can see, our virtual machine is up and running. It has been deployed. But before we actually enable JIT, I just want to show you something really quickly. So I'm going to navigate to my resource group by going to the search and typing NSG and selecting network security groups. And there's my JIT2 network security group. So I'm going to go ahead and select that. And I just wanted to show you something. You know, we've got our RDP port here. We don't have just-in-time access. So once we enable just-in-time access, you're going to see some things are going to change here. So again, let's um, navigate back to our virtual machines. And that's pretty easy as well. You just click virtual machines. We select our JIT2. Let's close just to get some more real estate. Underneath settings, come down to configuration. And underneath configuration, you'll see just-in-time access right at the top. So go ahead and click enable just-in-time access. This will go away and it will enable just-in-time access. And as you can see, just-in-time access has been enabled. But again, I just want to show you something as well. I'm going to navigate back to my uh, security groups and just show you something quickly. So I'm going to go back into that network security group. I'm going to go to uh, that JIT security group. And we will see now, once I ask for access, you will see now that we have security JIT enabled. So let's get some more real estate. And you can see here it's denied. So in order to allow access to that, we need to go and request access. So again, let's do that. Let's navigate straight back to our virtual machine. Let's click JIT02. Let's click underneath our configuration um, setting. And let's go to Microsoft Defender for Cloud. So I've gone under my setting, I've gone to configuration and I've selected Microsoft Defender for Cloud. So I click open that. And this will now bring us to our just-in-time access. And you can see here's our virtual machine. So in order to request access, we need to do a few things. But before we do that, I just wanna show you, if you move over to the far left and click this little hamburger menu, we can go ahead and we can edit stuff we can add more ports if we needed to add ports like port 22 for ssh or you may want to add another customized port that's up to you so i'm just going to navigate back to my just in time access i'm going to put a checkbox in that and this now becomes highlighted i'm going to go ahead and click request access so i'm going to turn that rdp port on and i'm going to say oh, i need access for one hour and i'm going to give this a name i'm just going to say um jet uh, test and click open ports. Now this will go away and it'll open up those ports for us. 
and we can see here request has been initiated so let's navigate back to our virtual machine let's click on our VM let's close that down once you are in your VM blade click connect click RDP and then of course we can come down here and we can say we can use my IP other IPs or all configured IPs you can be really granular so you can go ahead and click request access now this is going to go and see if you do have permission to access that virtual machine if you do have access to, to uh, connect to that virtual machine you will see here you have been granted access and port 3389 on the selected IPs have been approved so let's just quickly bounce back over to our virtual machine I mean to our network security groups and show you something else there quickly so if we go back into our network security groups and let's expand this you can see now we have this security rule that has allowed us to uh, get access to uh, JIT at the end of the day and I'll just smooth that over so that you can see and we now have that port open that will allow us to RDP into that virtual machine so let's go ahead and RDP into that virtual machine and see if we can connect and that will tell us whether we have access or whether we don't so I'm going to go ahead click the connect button again on JIT2 obviously I'm going to once I've uh, requested that access we uh, will get this button will then become highlighted and we can go ahead and we can download our RDP file so I'm going to go ahead and click download RDP file click open this is opened on a separate window click connect I'm going to go ahead and type in my user which was called uh, JIT and I'm going to go ahead this thing was AZ JIT I'm not too sure let's we'll soon see and then my user would be P type in that password and click connect and there we go you can see now it's connecting to JIT02 let's click yes and this should initiate that connection and I will open it up because I sorry drag it over because it's opened up on a second screen and there we go there's our uh, AZ JIT uh, user actually logging in and we're using Microsoft Azure JIT and JIT's a great way to allow people to access your network without compromising your systems you can give them access for a certain period of time whether it be one hour two hours or three hours it's up to you and they have that short time to perform their task so again it's really awesome that Microsoft have put this in into uh, Azure for us like I said it has been around for a while but they've now incorporated it with uh, Microsoft Defender which is absolutely amazing so I'm going to go ahead and just minimize this and just navigate back to my portal and go to Microsoft Defender for cloud and I'm just going to close this down so this will open up Microsoft Defender for cloud and of course if I come down to uh, my workload protections and we'll just give that a second to fire up you can see here where we have just-in-time uh, access you can enable it as well if I click on that it takes me straight back to that same blade as well so again it's incorporated with Defender and you can tell that because it says here home Microsoft Defender for cloud just-in-time access and of course we can go through and we can do a whole lot of things that we needed to do so basically that's how you enable JIT it's not very very hard to do it's pretty easy so I'd like to thank you for uh, viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next video Azure Security Key Vault in a nutshell so what is Azure Key Vault well Azure Key Vault is a cloud service for securely storing and access secrets a secret is anything you want to tightly control access to such as an API keys passwords certificates or cryptographic keys Azure Key Vault has two service tiers we have standard which encrypts with a software key and we have premium which includes a hardware security module or HSM protected keys so why use Key Vault well we use Key Vault to encrypt keys and small secrets like passwords that uh, need to be stored somewhere securely Key Vault is secure in a sense that nothing gets transmitted over the public internet all communication with the key uh, and the key vaults and Azure resources go through the backbone so they are secure by default 
Azure Key Vault is a service that you can use within your Azure subscription to securely store those secrets and keys and certificates in one centralized location. Of course, secrets management, Azure Key Vault can be used to securely store and tightly control access to tokens, passwords, certificates, APIs, and other secrets. In the key management, Azure Key Vault can be used as a key management solution. Azure Key Vault makes it easy to create and control the encryption of those keys used to encrypt your data. And then we have certificate management. Azure Key Vault lets you easily provision, manage, and deploy public and private transport layer security or secure uh, socket layer uh, certificates to use uh, within your Azure environment and your internal connected resources. So important things to note, we have the Vault owner. A Vault owner can create a key, can create a key Vault, sorry, and gain full access and can control it. The owner of the key Vault can also set up auditing to log who has access to those keys. Then we have the administrator that can control uh, access to the key lifecycle. They can also control the new versions of the key, back it up and do other related tasks. Then we have the Vault uh, consumer. A Vault consumer can perform actions on the assets inside the key Vault when the Vault owner grants uh, consumer access. The available actions depend on the permissions granted. Then we have the security principle. The Azure security principle is a security ID that user created app services and automation tools used to access Pacific Azure resources. Think of it as user identity, a username and password or a certificate with a specific role and a tightly controlled permissions. A security principle should only need to do specific things, unlike a general user identity. Again, to learn more about Azure Key Vault, I encourage you to go out to the link below and see how you can deploy Azure Key Vault in your environment and get more in-depth information about Key Vault. That being said, let's go in and do a live lab and let's deploy Azure Key Vault. Hi, and welcome to this lab, Deploying Azure Key Vault. So go ahead, log into your portal and navigate to your resource groups blade. As you can see, I'm already in my resource groups blade. I've clicked resource groups in my menu here and this has taken me straight to the main blade. Once you are in your resource groups blade, click create. Let's go ahead and give our resource group a name. I'm gonna call it Key Vault. And I'm gonna go ahead and click review and create and click create. This is gonna go away and create that resource group. Once that resource group has been created, we can then go ahead and create our Key Vault. Again, as you can see in the notification area, our resource group was successful in its deployment. So go ahead and dismiss all that. Go ahead in the search and at the top type in KEY and select Key Vaults. Once you are in the Key Vault blade, click Create. Let's put that Key Vault in that Azure Key Vault resource group. I'm gonna give my Key Vault a name. I'm gonna call it Key Vault 1007. It needs to be unique across Azure. So as you can see, it's gone away and it's actually said this is available and we have a tick against it. Scroll down and go ahead. And if we try to change this to one, you can see the default value uh, needs to be seven days and then it can go up to 90 days. So go ahead and type in seven. And of course you want to allow purge protection because at the end of the day, we are just doing a lab. In the real world, you would go ahead and um, allow this to keep that key vault so that it, uh, those keys cannot be deleted until that retention period has been uh, set up. So I'm gonna go ahead and type in seven, make sure we've got disabled purge protection to allow these objects to be deleted during the retention period. Click next. Again, we can go through and we can set up uh, our encryption for virtual disks and our virtual machines so that when our virtual machines are encrypted, it'll put those keys in that key vault for us. At the moment, we don't wanna do that, click next. As you can see, we're gonna do it on all networks, click next, click next on tagging. This will go away and do a validation process. We're not worried about uh, any taggings. Tagging again would be used for billing. Once um, we've reached this page, click create and this will go away, like I say, do the validation and then push out that key vault uh, deployment for us. And again, the, t the key vault deployment won't take too long 
to deploy. Again, it depends on your resources. That can be anywhere from one minute to maybe five minutes at the most, if that. And again, we'll just wait for this key vault to complete its deployment. And as you can see, that didn't take too long to deploy. And we can tell it was deployed successfully because we can see our notification here. I'm just going to close this down and click go to resource. This now takes us to our key vault blade or our key vault itself. And underneath settings, this is where we go ahead and create keys, secrets and certificates. So click on keys. Hey, let's go and create a sample key so that we can see what it's all about. So go ahead and click generate import at the top. I'm going to go ahead and paste a name in there. I'm going to call mine sample key 01. Again, we have key types. We can use an RSA or an EC key. And of course, we've got different key sizes from uh, 2048, 3072 and 4096. Of course, we could set up activation dates, expiry dates and of course, rotations. We're not too worried about that. Just click create. And this will go away and generate that sample key. If I click on that sample key, you can see there's my current version and it's keeping that key pretty safe. So let's navigate back to key vaults and let's select secrets. So now we can go down to our secrets and let's do the same thing. Let's create a sample secret. So click generate import. Let's do a manual. Obviously you could do a certificate if you wanted to, but let's just keep it as a manual. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna call mine um, sample secret. And of course you can call yours whatever you want. You can go ahead and give it a value. And I'm gonna go ahead and paste that value in there and just show you something. If you hover your mouse over here, the Azure currently only supports a single inline values. So if you want multi inline values, you need to actually use PowerShell or Bash. Again, we can go ahead and do some content type. Again, activation and expiry dates. You're not too worried about that. Go ahead and click create. And this will go away and create that sample for us. If we click on that sample secret, you can see there it is. Again, navigating back to our key vault, click on certificates and let's go and create a sample certificate. So click generate import. Of course, you could generate a certificate or you could import one. In our case, we want to generate one. So I'm just going to call my sample search. You can call yours whatever you like. It's going to be a self signed certificate and obviously we have to put a domain name. So we've got to say CN equals my domain name. So I'm going to say uh, CN equals my Azure guru.com. You could put what, 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 whatever domain name you wanted to put in there. Of course, we can go and give it a, a validation process, whether it's one month or a, 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 it's up to you or whether it's 12 months. Of course, you can choose the content type. Again, I'm going to go and just drag that down to one because this is just a training demo for you and click create. And this will go away and generate that sample certificate for us. As you can see, it's disabled because we haven't deployed it out. And you can see when it expires. So go ahead and click on that sample cert and you can see here what's going on. The nice thing, like I say, with Azure Key Vault, we could go ahead and click on our keys. We could back up our keys. We could manage keys. If I went to that key and I said delete, I said yes, and deleted that key and went, uh, did a refresh, uh, just closed this notification down and clicked manage deleted keys, you would see a little bit later on my deleted keys would be there if the purge operation was enabled through an access policy. So that's just something I want you to be uh, aware of at the end of the day. Again, if you wanted to delete a secret, it's pretty easy. You just click on the, the secret itself. You could download it for a backup. You could do a new version or you could go ahead and click delete and that would delete that as well. And the same with the certificate, we'd do that. We could download, we could do an insurance policy, we could do a certificate operation. But in our case, you want to delete this. So click delete and click yes. And that about covers um, deploying Azure Key Vault and getting your head around some very, very, very basic fundamentals. So I'd like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.
Hi, and welcome to this training lab on how to reset a virtual machine password and an Active Directory user's password. Now, you may be wondering why would you want to do this? Well, the main reason would be A, uh, the user has forgotten what their password is, so they can't actually log in to Active Directory and uh, use those resources, or they may need access to a virtual machine and they can't log in and they've forgotten their password. So how do we go about resetting that? That's pretty easy. Just log on to the Azure portal. And once you've logged into the Azure portal, let's navigate to Azure Active Directory in your left menu. If you don't see it at the top here, you can always go to the search and type in ACT and select Azure Active Directory from the dropdown. Once you are in the Azure Active Directory blade, click Users. And let's say for argument's sake, this user, AZ user, has forgotten their password. All you do is you click on that user. You go right to the top next to edit and say reset password. And this will go ahead and reset that user's password. Then you would click the reset password button and just give it a second to uh, validate and create that new password. Now, You'd have to copy that password into Notepad or uh, some other means and then text that to your user and tell your user that's their new password that they need to use to log on to Azure with. Now, how do we set a virtual machine password? Well, that's pretty easy. We just go straight over to virtual machines. As you can see, I've got virtual machines in my uh, menu here. I'm going to click on virtual machines. I'm going to go to that AZ FS01 server and I'm going to scroll down all the way to support and troubleshooting and I'm going to click reset password. Now if you notice when I try to click reset password I get an error at the top saying the virtual machine must be running before we can reset that password. So let's go to that virtual machine and let's start up that VM. And we'll just give it a second for that VM to fire up and then we'll go and reset its password. And as you can see, that didn't take too long. If you look at this little bell notification icon in your menu at the top here in your toolbar, it'll tell you that that virtual machine is up and running. Also, if you hit the refresh button just to make sure that that VM is in a running state and you can see that underneath the status, it says running. Now if we scroll all the way back down again and go to that menu under help and support and troubleshooting, you can see here we've got reset password. So click reset password. Now we can go ahead and reset the password. So we'll go and type in the user's name and then we'll go ahead and type in that new password. And then we'll go ahead and click update. And then we'll give it a, a minute or two for it to update. Again, it doesn't take too long to update. And as you can see in the notification icon here, it says the password reset was successful. So let's go and remote into this virtual machine and see if we can actually connect. So as you can see, I'm going to click connect. I'm just going to type in that password, hit enter, and as you can see, I'm getting a certificate warning telling me that I'm about to RDP into that machine. I'm going to click yes. I'm just going to drag this over because it's opened up on another screen and make this a bit bigger. And as you can see, we are now successfully remoting into our virtual machine into Azure after that password reset. And as you can see, resetting a password is very, very easy. The things that you need to remember uh, for argument's sake is you need to make sure that the virtual machine is running. If the virtual machine is not running, you will not be able to reset the password. With Active Directory, it doesn't really matter. You can just bounce straight into AD, select your user, and at the top, just do a password reset. So hopefully this will give you an understanding of how to reset a virtual machine password and an Azure Active Directory user's password.
I'd like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Azure Security, VM Managed Identities in a nutshell. What is an Azure Managed Identity? Well, Managed Identities for Azure Resources provide Azure services with an automatically managed identity in the Azure Active Directory. You can use this identity to authenticate to any service that supports AD authentication without having credentials in your code. How it works when a managed identity is configured on a VM, it updates the Azure Instance Metadata Endpoint with the Managed Identity Service Principal Client ID and the certificate. Afterwards, you need to grant identity access to the resource using RBAC or role-based access and using that uh, role to the service principal of that managed identity. The types of uh, managed IDs, first of all, we have the system assigned managed identities. System assigned man managed identities are automatically created along with the Azure resource and the life cycle of that managed identity depends on the Azure resource. If the Azure resource is deleted, the managed identity will automatically along with that resource be deleted as well. Then we have user assigned managed identities. The life cycle of a user assigned managed identity is independent of the Azure resources and these can be created separately and attached to any resource that supports managed identities. A single user assigned managed identity can be assigned to multiple Azure resources. So that being said, I encourage you to go out and have a look at this web link and get more information on how you can implement best practices and how you can set up your environment with managed identities. That being said, let's dive into a live lab and let's go and deploy a system managed identity so that you can see how this is done. Hi, welcome to this security lab uh, system identities or managed identities. What we're going to do in this lab, we're going to go ahead and assign a managed identity to our virtual machine. So log on to the portal and navigate to your resource groups. And if you don't have a virtual machine, go ahead and create one. So I have a virtual machine already. So I'm going to click on virtual machines in my menu on the left. Then I'm going to go ahead and select that virtual machine. I'm just going to close this to give me more real estate. And then underneath settings, you will see near the bottom, uh, underneath configuration identity. Click on identity. And now we're going to go and use a system assigned identity. So let's go and turn this on and click save and click yes. This will go ahead now and enable system aside identity for that uh, virtual machine. And we'll just give it a minute or two to kick in. It shouldn't take too long. And there we go. As you can see, it's already um, gone and assigned us that principal object ID, which is what we're after. I'm going to close this window down here. Under permissions, click roles, Azure roles and assignments. This will take us to the role and assignments blade. So click add role. And for the scope, I'm going to go ahead and select my resource group. So if you're not 100% sure what your resource group is, it's pretty easy. You can just go back to your resource group. You can say, okay, my resource group is called Security Basics. So I'm going to go ahead and copy that group name. I'm going to bounce straight back into my virtual machine, click on my VM and go all the way back down to identities. Go ahead and click on role assignments, click add roles. I'm going to do that scope. It's going to be at a resource group level. And there we go. It's automatically detected that uh, security group for us. If we had multiple uh, resource groups, as you can see, I have one called Azure Training and I have another one called Network Watcher. So make sure you select a resource group that you've created that's got your virtual machine running in it. In my case, it's running in Security Basics. Now we need to go and add a role. So click in that box and we can go down and we can add a role. And there are so many roles that we can choose from. But let's type in virtual machine. And let's go and select virtual machine administrator login. You can choose whatever role you want. I encourage you to explore and play with the different roles. So let's select the role that I've decided to choose and click save. And this will go ahead and save that role for us. And there we go, that role has been uh, assigned and saved. And we can go back into our virtual machine and we can see everything's ready to go. So the next part of the lab that we need to do is we actually need to now RDP to our virtual machine to see if we can connect. 
So navigate back to virtual machines, select your VM. In my case, my VM has uh, is off, so I'm going to go ahead and start that virtual machine. And we'll just wait for that VM to fire up and then we will remote into our virtual machine. As you can see, my virtual machine has started. So you can see that in this notification section, I'm going to go ahead and dismiss these notifications and we will go and now and connect to our virtual machine. I'm just going to hit refresh to confirm that that virtual machine is running. I'm going to go ahead and log into that virtual machine. Sorry, it's opening up on a separate window. I'm going to go ahead and paste in my password. And as you can see, I'm getting a certificate. So this is telling me it's ready to connect. Sorry, it's opening up on a second window because I have a dual screen. As Soon as that virtual machine window fires up, I will actually drag it across into Azure, as you can see. And we are now remoting into our virtual machine using managed identity for that VM in the background. It's a nice way to secure your virtual machines. There's a lot of things you can do with managed identities. You can go ahead and apply them to a wide range of resources. So I'm going to go ahead and close that down. So you're probably saying to yourself, well, how do I delete that managed identity because I don't need it anymore? Well, that's pretty easy as well. I can, you can just scroll down back to your virtual machine and underneath settings, select identity. And then of course you could say turn off and click save and click yes. And what that would do is that would deregister that um, identity for you. So you'll just give it a second to deregister and there you go. You can see there it's disabled the system assigned managed identity successfully. If you're wanting to do it again, you would have to go and turn that back on. And you could do the same with user assigned as well. You could go ahead and click add and then you could go ahead and filter by different um, users uh, in Active Directory. So there's a wide range of things that you can do. This is just a basic introduction to get you familiar with what uh, identities do. So I'd like to thank you for viewing and I look forward to seeing you in the next lab.